Hello and welcome back to Automation. Uh, last time we designed the coconut, that's still got a good long design cycle ahead of it. Uh, and we also did the second uh, facelift of the MATN, or the first facelift, second version of the MATN. And I think the first thing to do today is just advance time until that facelift comes out. Because our inline factory has had another quality issue. I'm just going to go ahead and do a full recall here. Not interested in losing some of our hard-earned prestige. Don't mind that much about reputation. Four-seater factory has got higher than anticipated repair costs. Really not much. Uh, so, yeah, let's just pay 20 million in cash. It's nice and easy for us. Uh, ditto on the inline factory, next to nothing. So there we go. The MATN has been released and that gave us a nice boost to our sales. We were making about uh, 70 million. We're now up to 116 million a month, really raking it in. The Aussie is starting to show its age. It's still really quite good in the uh, light sports premium convertible sport categories, but its sales are beginning to wear down a little bit. Let's still hang in there. I think it will definitely carry us over to the coconut. Uh, but for now, we've got some nice new interior technology that I think is worth putting into a new facelift on the MATN. Uh, most notably, we've got now premium sat-nav and um, luxury sat-nav since the last time as well. We are incidentally in the new millennium now. So this is our O2 facelift. Let's see if we can improve the engine at all. Okay, so we've made some general improvements here. The biggest thing we've done is I've decided to go for direct injection uh, over the multi-point EFA. And really, uh, that lets us have a lot more octane to play around with. And I've decided to put this really into improving our fuel economies. We've got really very efficient car here, which helps bring down the overall cost. So overall, they like it more. And it's about the same price point. The money they're spending on the engine, you save on the off-fuel costs. So not really too much changed uh, here in the premium budget trim. Uh, the main sort of big differences have moved to electric power steering away from hydraulic. It's just a little bit cheaper, and they do like it a little bit more. It's not really that much. Basically, you lose a little bit of sportiness. You gain a little bit of reliability. It's not a massive difference, uh, but it ends up being a tad cheaper overall. And so I think I'm going to go for that. The one that we are going to be able to put more things into is our premium line. I think I am going to leave it on premium CD after all, it's just the sat-navs and the luxury CD are just a huge jump in price for a relatively small jump in comfort. And I don't think that's really going to work out for us. We'll go for the advanced zero, zero zeros though. On safety, just because that does make a lot more difference per sort of price unit. I'm going to go for active sway bars just to get that bit more comfort boost. Uh, especially for the luxury market. So there we go. Pretty good. A uh, luxury, luxury premium car. So reasonably affordable on the premium market, almost 80%. Anyone who can't get that can still drop down to the premium budget version. Uh, but the luxury market, quite like it, and they can all afford it. Equally, luxury premium, quite like it, and they definitely can all afford it. And as always, it's spilling over into some of these categories, notably commuter premium and family premium. We are pushing the limits of the medium three, but I don't want to upgrade the factory mid-production role. Uh, so I'll wait until we're replacing the MATN before going over to a large. I think we should be thinking towards that. Okay, aiming for a 60-month uh, research time. Let's us Bump up a couple of the things to a process, decrease the pressure in funding a little bit, 
engine with its direct injection is taking a lot of research. We are going to have to play around with some of its settings. It's inevitably taking down the automation by quite a bit. That lets us get this out in 60 months as well. Here now to try and balance the price points. Okay, so uh, selling the budget version at 16,000, premium version at 32,000. Expect us to make 8 billion back in the five year probable cycle this thing is going to have. And so that's all looking very good. 400 million project costs, but that's nice, easy. That's getting to be small change for us. So we can sign that off, and now we'll advance time until the coconut comes out. Okay, Sports Factory, slightly higher refresh cost. Again, nothing we need to worry about. And there we go. The coconut is out of uh, production. Uh, already making 27 million. Even its pre-production, it was making 10 million a month just on pre-orders. And this is a huge jump up of the price of the factory. You can see we're now sitting on 6.24 billion. Um, straight away, this is coming out completely using its current factory. Well, as normal, we're not just going to sit idly by. We're going to take this thing and turn around, put it straight back into doing its first facelift. It's not done too much to the engine. Main thing I've done is change over to a twin configuration direct injection system. And the effect that that has had after some tweaking and balancing is we get a fair bit better fuel efficiency, uh, ever, so, ever so slightly more expensive, but saving money all in all. Uh, tiny, tiny cost of horsepower, really nothing to write home about. But we do get a little bit better throttle response. Okay, so the Light Swartz premium budget is looking really good right now. Incredibly desirable and very affordable in its target uh, demographic. Equally muscle premium. You can do well, the sport brands are there. It's a bit expensive for them, but they're there. And it's definitely hitting both the super and the hypercar market. So really good. Version not really changed too much. Biggest change I put in the dual clutch, which they just really, really like. Uh, considering this market likes the mix of sportiness and drivability, this is kind of the best of both worlds. Otherwise, just a little bit of balancing here and there. Uh, interior stayed exactly the same. We have changed over to electric variable. Uh, again, that just gives it a bit of a sportiness boost compared to what it has. Um, and is kind of the better one right now uh, out of the two. It is going to take us some more engineering time to get that, but I think it's going to be worthwhile. And I'm going to be changing over to standard 00's safety just to keep us future-proofed. So the Light Sports Premium has ended up a tad more expensive, but massively more desirable. In terms of what we've done, we've given it the dual clutch as well. That's the biggest change there. Otherwise, just played around with a few minor settings. Also changed it to electric variable and the standard 00's safety. Okay, so over to the convertible sports. Uh, it's all in red because the tires are now blowing out. I'll just balance that. Okay, and the convertible sports version. Again, we're arriving at some nice numbers here. It's a bit expensive for the convertible. I believe the previous one was as well, but it's still getting decent-ish numbers there. Very good convertible sports, though. Uh, again, we're going for this kind of standardized dual clutch uh, approach with the uh, electric variable power steering and standard uh, zero zeros. Now we're on to our convertible luxury one. This is the four-seater variant. Of this sort of ridiculously expensive style. Again, even though I want to go for the higher end systems, I just don't think they're worth it. The luxury sat nav is even cutting into the convertible luxury market's affordability. There's five grand instead of 1,000. So, huge, huge jump that. I think I'm just going to leave that as is.
but that's looking pretty good there. So nicely hitting convertible luxury market as well as the GT markets, particularly the upper end GT premium one. Yeah, and pretty much I've done the same thing. Stuck in the dual clutch, balanced a few bits and bobs, electric variable power steering, and standard zero zeros safety. So on to our last trim, the super, convertible super rather. But on this one, I am going to go for the luxury sat nav. They did have a luxury CD before, so that is a more reasonable jump. And this is our super stupid top of the range car anyway. So we go, wanted it to be a convertible supercar, and it is. It's also a regular supercar and a hypercar. So I'm going to target another 90 month cycle on this one. Uh, just with this many trims, I think it's worthwhile putting in the extra time. The current ones are selling fine. This should be good. The main thing this lets us do is really optimize the process. And so that drags down the cost. So the average cost went from 25,000 per uh, car down to 19,000. So really big saving there. And I think that's going to help us a lot. Targeting 90 months on the engine as well. And again, the main thing that's let us do is really just boost all of these uh, sliders. So we're now producing the engines for 3.8 thousand as opposed to 5.5 thousand. So let's put in the price points and see how we're doing. Okay, so we've got some very nice numbers here again. White Swatch Premium selling for 37,000. White Sports for 21,000. Convertible Sports for 35,000. Convertible Luxury for 57,000. And Convertible Super Osso for 57,000. It's kind of your choice. Do you want extra seats or extra luxury? That's giving us a six billion uh, estimated profit. Now I'm just going to save this and do a quick experiment just to see if it is worth putting it in a new factory. We can't expand the factory that we've got so on the biggest plot that we have. We can just buy a new plot. So I'm going to look into doing that. So all cost put in, we are now making this less of a profit but not that much less of a profit and we are getting an entire new factory out of this so i think that's going to be worth it and i don't believe these numbers i'm not sure exactly what's gone if you hear uh, supposedly these should be quite accurate but every single time we've just been maxing out all of our factories so i think this is going to be worthwhile Double checking, and the engine factory currently is not overworked, so that should be fine. See, if we need to overwork the engine factory, we will. So it's 2 billion. We can easily afford that, no problem at all. And that should really increase our output of cars. So now let's advance time until the MATN's facelift is complete. There we go. MATN 02 variant is now out and it is selling very well still, over a hundred million per month. As ever, the MATN is starting to show its age, uh, it came out 91 92, so it is a good 15 years old. And the game ends in 2020, so we've still got 15 years ahead of us. I think that's a pretty nice way to squeeze in a new model there. I don't think we will ever be replacing the coconut. I think it's just going to be a sort of one more facelift after uh, the current one. We'll take it through to 2020. And so this is likely to be our last new car project. Let's just make sure that we've got a decent car body that we can put into it. And in fact, yes, we definitely do because we've unlocked every single car body at this point. Very much reaching the end game here, right near the end of the tech tree. And so we've got a huge number to choose from. So let's kick off our new car project. And we're going to be aiming for this market over here as normal. And at first, uh, we'll be designing sort of 
cheaper end of things, the premium budget car, and we'll certainly be doing other trims. Now we might even split this uh, since uh, we've already got convertible market covered with our other car. We can really just um, go all out on these kind of trims if we want to. But premium budget first. I think we're going to end up going for this one here. Uh, 2009 uh, sedan, 3.1 meter wheelbase. Uh, I was trying to decide between this one and this one up at the top here. Um, and really, out of the two, this one just looks a little bit nicer. It's got a little bit less uh, drag. Uh, I don't think the sort of plastic panel on the side really goes with a sort of top end premium car. This certainly does look like a top end premium car. It's only two years behind, so it's not going to make really that much difference. And it does actually have less drag. I did have to remind myself that we don't need a convertible option. So at first I was looking through all of these, trying to find a hard top version, then realized we've already got all of that covered. There's no need to double up on the convertible, so we're just going all in on the sedan here. And we don't want this to be too expensive, but don't want it to be too cheap either. Uh, so I'm going to go for partial aluminium and a semi-space frame, kind of hedging our bets just like we did with the uh, coconut. That seemed to be working out quite well for that. And I think this would be quite good here. So this one only has the engine in front. Uh, try fitting it in longitudinally. If not, you can always try fitting it in transverse and doing double wishbone multi-link. So I'm going to do something a little bit different this time, just to really make the most of this. It's probably going to be the last car we're designing. I may well use our current inline engine uh, for the cheaper end of the car, but I really want to put in a V16 engine. Uh, got the V16 pack to support the developers a little bit ago. Never really used it. And we need to put in at least one V16. I was hoping to do it on the sports range, but the problem is that cars were just too small. But now we've got a nice, giant, big-ass car, and so we can, in fact, fit in a V16 with reasonable dimensions. This is now an 8-litre V16 here, really going for our kind of top-of-the-end market. So I think we've ended up with a pretty decent engine. So this is comparing it against the inline one from the previous build. So you can see massively, massively more powerful. Uh, not quite as powerful as our sports engines, but pretty much there. It is more expensive. There's no way around that. It's definitely a more expensive engine. Uh, but really ridiculously smooth. Good power output. A reasonable fuel efficiency compared to the previous ones. So... I think this will be nice to put into our sort of top of the range uh, cars. Um, if we're going to be having a uh, inline engine as the cheaper version, then this one is going to need to go into a different factory, but that's fine. We can afford to put in a big factory just to cover this engine. It's so comparing this against the latest version of our sport engine. We do have a lot less power, about half the power. Uh, but we do have the power of a much broader range. This is much, much smoother to drive, is more reliable, and is a hell of a lot more fuel efficient. And is actually cheaper, generally. A bit more complicated to build, but cheaper material-wise. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, this has ended up being 8 litres. And as normal, we've gone for the uh, turbo. Uh, doing our normal now direct injection engine. Uh, no cassette converter and baffled and baffled. There's certainly a big engine, but that's what we expected. Let's see how this one sounds then. sounding very, very smooth there. 
Uh, definitely given the power output it's getting. I mean, that's pretty decent for our sort of top end engine. So, this is our turbo direct injection 07 model of our 16, uh, V16 8 liter engine. Now, the various trim options that we have here, I'm going to go for this one. Basically, it's two door, four door, or hatchback. And really, for the market we're going for, definitely they want the four door sedan. And despite what I did, Previously, just because I've put in that giant fancy engine, I am going to be aiming this one at the premium market, and then I'll try and do a separate trim aiming at the premium budget market. Definitely going all-wheel drive for this one. I'm probably going to go for the dual clutch. They seem to really like that on the other ones. Not, we'll go for advanced automatic. Actually, initial guesses are not half bad for the premium market. Uh, solidly in there and reasonably affordable. So here we've ended up with a really quite nice car. Uh, so this was targeted at the premium and it's an excellent premium car that 80% of the market can afford. So that's looking really good. It's also a really attractive luxury car that 93% of the market can afford. And even though it's not highlighting it here, it's actually a really, really good Luxury premium car, uh, 206 competitiveness is nothing to be sniffed at. And basically, the entire market can afford that. Um, also, various other categories GT, GT Premium. It's even counting as a convertible despite not being a convertible. And then, family premium, commuter premium, pretty much any kind of premium market this is being catered towards. And in terms of what we've got in it, ended up with dual clutch. Uh, six uh, gear, went for medium uh, compound tires in the end, magnesium rims, got six piston uh, vented discs front and back. Just because this car actually has quite a lot of grip between rather thick tires and just a really, really heavy car. Uh, so we can actually put a lot of braking here. It will skid at higher speeds if you slam on the brakes. Uh, but Anything up to about uh, 100 kilometers, you should be fine. And so I think that's a pretty good balance. Uh, got fully cloud, didn't bother with cooling flaps because we basically have no cooling on this. Uh, the engine actually doesn't require much cooling, so there's no need uh, to mess around with all of that. And so that gives us a nice uh, steering profile. You can see the steering at high speed is actually pretty decent. But Worries wants to understeer a little bit around 150. Um, above 150, it really starts to oversteer. But that's a good range that we've got good, decent, controlled steering. Uh, Interior-wise, we've got premium and premium CD. That was just a good balance between affordability and uh, price point. We could put in all of these much fancier sat navs or luxury infotainment but the price just jumps up massively for not really that big an improvement in comfort or prestige so i really don't think those are going to be worth it safety aids have gone for electric variable this is a really really good uh, general option here for the power steering it's cheap but really really good so i think once you've unlocked this it's kind of the way to go i've gone for electronic i didn't go for launch control. It does add a little bit to the quality, a little bit to the sportiness, but it just comes at a huge penalty to engineering time. And I don't think I really want to have to pay that. I'd prefer to put some extra time in keeping the cost down of these cars. And just threw in standard uh, safety. Suspension is comfort, has for active comfort, semi-active passive sway bars and so i'm really happy with uh, this version it's definitely going to be the version i want to take out on the test track so let's see how it does on the test track so 115 full first turn it's really impressive for all of our non-sport variety cars and finishing in 216 uh, that's Downright brilliant. Um, that's not quite as fast as some of the sports cars we've put out, but it's getting really close there. 
Um, so definitely a nice all-rounder car that we've put together. Well, next, we're going to be trying to make this thing look as pretty as possible. Um, so let's put on the time lapse and I'll catch you afterwards. Okay, I think I'm pretty happy with that all in all. Uh, so this is the Spiff. Uh, it's the premium variant of the Spiff. So Spiff after uh, the Spiffing Brit. Oh, pretty much. Back might be a little too busy. I'm not really sure. Really do like the front on this one, though. Sides are okay. Don't think the sides needed much. They've already got... Uh, detailing on the actual bodywork itself so not really much that's needed there unfortunately there aren't really rear uh, lights that match the front lights but i think it looks pretty good certainly looks the part of a executive type car which is what we're going for so with that one done let's have a go at making the premium budget version seeing if we can get it at all affordable with the crazy ass um, engine that we've stuck into it. If not, we can just open a new engine factory and have two different types of engine. Okay, so stripping out basically all of the bells and whistles, but we can we get this down to 63.8%. Uh, that's with basic interior, basic CDs, crappiest braking systems that we possibly can have, smaller tyres. Uh, Still have the traction aids and power steering, they're not too expensive. Ripping out all the springs and dampeners, any kind of uh, active systems there. And so 63%, not bad. Let's see how the overall market's going. So this no longer qualifies as a premium car at all. It's just got two heavy penalties there for having too low a comfort. Uh, but this does then get sold in sort of convertible commuter premium markets. It's not bad. Now, I do want to experiment here. I am going to clone that one. And I'm going to, on the clone, I'm going to stick in our old engine, see what that does to the affordability and everyone's happiness. So our old engine was the inline six. Uh, sorry, that does significantly improve the affordability of this. A top of the range engine may be kind of pushing it in terms of expensive. Okay, so we quite like this as our uh, design here. So this one now counts as a premium. 
uh, but very, very affordable premiums. You don't have to worry that the other one's a bit expensive. Uh, still very reasonable premium budget, and I've got 73% of that market. And it's spilling over into loads of others, uh, notably the family market. Uh, so we should be able to get huge amounts of money there. Uh, even though this is four seat, it's just a really nice four seat. And so with this worse engine, I've been able to put in standard CD over basic CD and improve the brakes just a little bit. And that's enough to get rid of the low comfort and low sportiness penalties or at least significantly reduce them. So that premium is at least interested in this car. So I'm going to go ahead and trash our original premium budget. So we've got premium version, which is working on the new engine. Premium budget version is working on the old engine. I am just going to edit that engine project. So if we're putting the six liter, oh sorry, three liter back into a car, we may as well update it. Even if we can't really put in a new tech, we can at least put it through another engineering round and so uh, improve reliability and so on. So we just tweaked a couple of things, we lost a little bit of horsepower, but we've gained a fair bit on our smoothness and fuel efficiency. And so the budget market will like that. So those are our two designs. Let's put them into uh, engineering. This was pushing the limits uh, with the previous car that we had. So I'm gonna bite the bullet, upgrade to a large one factory. Do you need to add the semi space frame? Add in the maintenance building. Okay, so targeting 90 months on this. All we really needed to lower is the tooling. That really didn't have a big effect because a lot of this is high tech handmade. Doesn't really matter that we are sacrificing automation. Okay, so initially I'm going to put the inline engine through its process because that's sticking with the inline factory imagine the medium one factory should still be able to handle it if not we can edit it later remember this isn't doing all of the engines it should only be doing about half the engines so we are targeting 90 months getting the tooling really optimized for this this is the sweet spot any more automation and it actually costs more Really optimizing the reliability. So this is looking like a really good variant of this engine, really coming along. So let's take that off. And so let's look at the V16 engine in all of its craziness. And we need to buy ourselves a new factory. Keeping everything in free near for now. It's got a decent balance between labor cost and skill. Yeah, plot sizes aren't really expensive in terms of how much we're doing. And so this is going to be called the V16 factory. Actually, I'll go for large. Large should be more than enough. Initially, I'm going to guess that we only need medium one, but we've got the plot there if we need to upgrade. Check in the maintenance building should save us money in the long run. Put in a little bit of automation tooling quality. Costs us a bit to outlay, but it does bring down the cost and improve our overall quality. And I've decided to chuck in a staff facility here uh, just because it's a brand new site, so they don't really have that skill built up. And so this engine is taking a lot to engineer. We don't really know anything about making V16, so it's going to be a huge outlay. But we can get it out in 90 months still. Just have to reduce a lot of these. Yeah, and that means we're going to have to try and improve this in the first facelift. That's fine. Although right now it is predicting that this engine factory is going to be significantly overworked. And it's still considering that it's going to be slightly overworked. Well, in that case, uh, let's go straight to a large one to begin with. Yep. Now this engine factory shouldn't be overworked anymore. It's not changed anything in terms of the research time. Okay, and so now it's time to price these two cars. Okay, so here we are. The premium variant selling for 41.8 thousand. 
with the premium budget selling for 17.8 thousand that's predicting us a five-year profit of 18 billion all costs included so i think that looks really good and that's including all of those big upfront costs of the ridiculous amounts of money that we are putting into building new factories so i think that's certainly worth it see there the engine factories are both matching so there we go sign all of those off this is going to be a 2.84 billion dollar project but i think that's going to pay off very very nicely so there we have it and considering the length of these projects i think that's a good place to leave the automation part of this project for this time our next episode will return and probably that will be our last episode by the time these comes out we can maybe get one facelift out for each of these and then we hit 2020 you can keep playing the game after 2020 uh, but there's no new technologies that come up uh, no new car bodies come up so it's uh, i rapidly lose interest after that and they've got no plans right now to go past 2020 really because car engines are moving away from the petrol engines which this whole engine is about and onto sort of either hybrid or electric or fuel cell and so that would really require a completely new engine designer, which they don't currently have planned, at least not for a release. But for now, uh, we can end this episode by jumping over and seeing how the uh, spiff handles um, when we drive it. So I'll catch you in BeamNG. Hello, everyone, and welcome over to BeamNG Drive. And here is the spiff. And so it's looking really quite nice from the front. Very happy with that. It's pretty decent from the side. And it's a bit busy from the back. Uh, not helped by the huge amounts of smokes coming out due to our lack of catalytic converters. Oh god, it's very, very bright on the back. Too many lights on the back. Uh, not too bad on the front. Rather bright on the side for some reason. And apparently the... Uh, antenna on the roof has its own little light for some reason. Right, let's see how this handles. That accelerates pretty damn well given its size. It does not turn very well. Lots of screeching. It also doesn't seem to break overly well. It does have a ridiculous amount of power behind it. And an almost silent engine, has to be said. It does feel by far the smoothest car that we've put together. Has no problem on the straight, 170 there. But I need to slow down much sooner than that. Trying to have a hope of landing this thing. Alright, so I'm going to practice around a little bit, and then I will catch you at the uh, time trial. Okay, so this is a bit of a change from the previous luxury models we've had, which were mostly easy to handle in comparison to the sports cars, but not that fast. This is very much the opposite. This is very, very fast, really accelerates surprisingly well, and it uh, can kind of get away from you with speed, just how quiet the engine is. 
but it does not like turning and it does not like braking. So it is rather challenging to take around the course. Anyway, let's see how we do. And uh, so the times to beat are 2.16 was the automation test track time. Uh, 2.24 is my best BeamNG time with the coconut. And so let's just see where we end up here. Accelerating out in sports mode. We have to watch the speed to get this thing to turn. Which is made very difficult by the fact this thing does not like to brake at all. Whether it's too damn fat with its V16. The brakes just barely have any effect on it. not helped by the fact it's really easy to go much faster than you think you are, thanks to the incredibly quiet but incredibly powerful engine. I'm sure this would be fine for actual driving around, you know, motorways and roads, just not so much around a racetrack. Careful on the chicanes. So have to come to a near complete stop. And this car does not like coming to near complete stops. Yeah, I thought I gave myself more than enough room there, and it was barely enough. Lost at that. Tiles have to break. Right, 240. So, yeah, didn't get the automation test track. Time, no surprise there. Six seconds behind the, the Aussie, apparently, as our next time there. Uh, well behind the coconut. We did, though, beat the quill. Um, quite happy with that. Uh, beat the quill by quite a bit, so despite the fact that this car is a lot harder to drive than the quill or the MATN, just that power on the straight is making up for that. So really quite a interesting car to drive, I'd say. Uh, it just has too much power, too much weight to it for the brakes and the wheels to be able to handle. Uh, but as normal, I'll post this on the Google Drive. The link will be down in the description. And so if you'd like to try this out, by all means do. And good luck getting it to turn around corners. And I think that's enough for today. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, uh, like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And I will catch you in the next and possibly final episode of this series. Cheers.